here tonight, we have not gathered to hear what I have to say. When we gather here tonight, we are here to hear what God has to say. And that is why we study this book. So turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. It should be real easy for everybody to find here tonight. Genesis chapter 1, it's on page 1 of your Bible. Just open it up to the first book, and we're going to Genesis chapter 1 as we continue our Life in Babylon series. We began this last weekend by talking about the sufficiency of Scripture, and you know the goal of this series is to equip you as a teenager to live for Christ in a culture that is against God, to think biblically and to engage lovingly with some of the increasing sins that are taking place and becoming common in our day that we are living. And so today, we're going to study the scripture to see God's good design on the topic of gender. Genesis chapter 1, I want you to begin reading with me in verse 26, and we'll read all the way down to verse 31 to get the context and then zero in on verse 27. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and every beast of the earth, and every bird of the heavens, and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning on the sixth day of creation. That's God's word. Let's have a brief word of prayer, and then we'll dive into it together here tonight. Let's all pray. Oh, Father, we come before you right now to commit this study of Scripture to you. God, as we do this Life in Babylon series over the summer, my prayer is that you would equip us from your word to think biblically about sin and what's going on in our day, and also that you would equip us to engage lovingly. And so I pray right now, God, as we're going to study your word and we are going to see your good design on the topic of gender. God, I pray that you would renew our minds, that you would wash us, that you would cleanse us. God, it is so easy to get influenced by the ways and the thinking of this world. And I pray here tonight that we would not be conformed, but that we would be transformed by the washing of water that happens with your word. So please, God, speak clearly and powerfully through me by the power of your spirit. And I pray for all of my friends here, my brothers and sisters in this room tonight, that you would give them eyes to see what you have said in your word, that you would give them ears to hear them speak straight to your soul. And God, I pray that you would give us hearts to receive so that way we might live, leaving here tonight in a way that brings you much glory and honor, that lifts the name of Jesus Christ high and makes an impact for your glory in this world. We pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. So I was recently asked, a question not too long ago by a high school student. And the question was, what makes a person? That was a real question that someone asked me. And they said, is it their body, their biology, or is it their mind, their feelings, and the way that they think? This friend of mine that asked me this question, this high school student, is someone that I've been meeting with. I've been meeting with them, honestly, on a regular basis They struggle periodically with feelings of depression. They've got more virtual friends on another continent than they do at their local high school. And we got into this conversation because when this person said that to me, that was the day that I asked this person, hey, let me ask you, do you believe in God? 
We've had long conversations. This wasn't the first time that I was hanging out with this person. We've had long conversations, and they've told me all about their interest in music and art. I've sat and listened as they explain the plot, the storyline, the character developments, and all of their favorite animes that they love to watch and the manga that they read. And their response to my question, do you believe in God, was, well, I'm not sure. I struggle with that concept, is what they said. And behind their struggle was a difficulty with, their words, certain rules that God has given in the Bible. And when I asked them what they meant by that, they said, basically, number one on their list was gender. And as I talked to my friend that I've been meeting with on a regular basis and having conversations with, they, they said that transitioning genders is not something that they are currently thinking through, but they have many friends at their school, online that they talk to, who are experiencing gender dysphoria. Confusion on the topics of gender and biology seems to be the intersection where teenagers are currently wrecked today. I am, uh, a lot of you guys know this, some of you guys try to find this out about me. I am 28 years old. There you go. Everybody knows. I'm 28 years old, which means, I know, mind-blowing, I graduated from high school 10 years ago. And uh, I started working with high school students in ministry 10 years ago. So pretty much the past 14 years of my life have been devoted to either being a high schooler or working with high schoolers, and I took time to think back to my time in high school, and I honestly don't ever remember this current issue of transgenderism even being brought up as a teenager. Maybe my memory fails me, but it feels new. And not only new, it feels like it is rapidly escalating. If you are a teenager today, you might feel like you are a man trapped inside of a woman's body. Or if you don't feel that way, you most likely might know someone who does. Or you've been in conversations about this. I want to make it very clear here tonight, I feel burdened for you. I do. I feel burdened for teenagers. I feel burdened for our culture. I love you, and I believe God does too. And I have a desire to speak clearly from God's word to cut through all of the confusion that we are faced with today. So let's start here and let's ask the question, what does the Bible teach about gender? How should we think biblically about what's going on today in our culture? Well, the truth is, if you look up the word transgender in a Bible concordance, you won't find a single use of that word in all of Scripture, but do not think for a second that the Bible is silent on this issue. I love what our friend in ministry, Kevin DeYoung, says. When it comes to transgenderism, the Bible actually has a lot to say. Not by a proof text here or a proof text there, but by a rich and pervasive understanding of gender and sexual identity. The Bible has so much to say on this topic, we just need to learn how to think biblically about it. And so I want to show you God's perfect design from the very beginning. Look back at verse 27 of Genesis 1, and I want you to notice how one word gets repeated three different times. It says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created created them. So this is point number one, and you can write it down in your handout here tonight. The creator defines gender. God's design on gender is very clear from the very beginning. In a perfect world, which is what is Genesis 1, you had a female created with an XX chromosome, and you had a male created with an XY chromosome. 
Now, two chapters later in the Bible, we know this because we talked about it this past Thursday night at United, if you were here, as we kicked off our Road to Emmaus summer series. Two chapters later in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, that same man and that same woman that God created chose sin, and now we live in a fallen, broken world. God's good design has been distorted. It has been perverted. And this fully explains why people have feelings of gender dysphoria. You have to understand the Bible explains why we feel the way that we do today. The reason is so clear. Sin corrupts. That's what sin does. Our human experience is tainted in every way by sin. All we've known is a sinful world. Our actions, our desires, our mental thoughts are all corrupted by our own sin from within and the sin in our culture that is so pervasive and trying to conform you into the ways of this world. And so it makes sense. You can feel a different gender than the one that you were born. I'm not dismissing those feelings here tonight, but the Bible is clear that those feelings are not rooted in reality. And they should not be acted upon. How you feel does not change who you are. Biology does not bend at ideology. What you think. Andrew Walker, who wrote a book called God and the Transgender Debate, said this. The biggest claim of the transgender movement is that a man who thinks he's a woman can really be a woman and vice versa. The problem is that this is a philosophical claim that is not true and can never be true in any way or form. A man's chromosomes cannot be engineered into female chromosomes. Altering one's appearance cosmetically or surgically cannot change the underlying reality of a person's biological makeup. The psychology of the mind cannot override the facts of a person's biological markers. Now, while the Bible might not include the word transgender in it, if you undergo surgery to change your gender, if you act like another gender, or if you prefer a different set of pronouns, the Bible's teaching is clear, that is sin. It is a distortion of God's good design. It will lead to the destruction of our society as we know it through the inability to fulfill the first God-given command right here in Genesis 1, 28, to be fruitful and multiply. You cannot do that if we continue to carry out the way that this thing is going. And ultimately, do you want to know what this will all lead to? It will damn a soul to hell because of the rejection towards the Creator, which should be, as Christians, our primary concern. And this is where my gender-confused friends will say, but it doesn't harm anybody. You know, if God really does love us, why would he not allow us to express our feelings however we choose if they don't harm anyone? You need to understand something very important about what the Bible teaches. Our bodies are not our own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, your body is not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. God is our creator. And just like Some of you guys might know this as you're beginning to drive and maybe your parents have gotten you a car and your parents are leasing you that car. Just like if you lease a car, you don't have the right to change the color on that car, no matter what you feel like it should be or no matter what you want it to be, we don't have the right to do with our bodies whatever we want when they actually belong to God. And I want to make it very clear here tonight, whether you've thought about this or whether someone you know has thought about this, and you've heard someone say something about how it doesn't harm anyone, it might not seem like it harms anyone we know, but most studies show it does harm the person who is doing it, who's thinking about it. Here's a statistic. According to the transgender survey, 40% of respondents that were transgender to this survey noted that they had attempted suicide in their lifetime which is nearly nine times the attempted suicide rate in the U.S. 
Among those who identify as trans, there is a noted increase in depression, anxiety, and attempted suicide. So it might not seem to harm others, but is it worth the apparent harm to yourself? And let's also make this very clear here tonight at church. It did harm someone. It doesn't harm someone is not true. It harmed someone, and you and I know exactly who it is. It harmed our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He died for sin, including this one. And the good news is, is like any sin, this one can be forgiven. While this sin might feel unique or unpardonable because of the current cultural moment that we found ourselves in, where everybody is so hot on their thoughts about this topic, it is not. Okay, so let's do a little bit of a Bible study here tonight. Go with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 22. Okay, I want to actually help you understand what God has to say about a person altering their gender, because although the word transgender might not be in the Bible, this idea actually is, and I want to help you see it. Deuteronomy 22. And in Deuteronomy, God's giving his law for his people as they are about to enter the promised land. And so God is telling Israel how to act and how not to act. And he has the right to do that as the creator and because they are his people. Deuteronomy 22, look at verse 5. It says, A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. You want to know what that verse teaches? It's so clear. If you're a man, dress like a man. If you're a woman, dress like a woman. Why? Because God made you. And God doesn't make mistakes. He formed you in your mother's womb, and he knew exactly what he was doing when he made you. Look with me at Deuteronomy 23. And I'll just preface by saying that we're going to need some maturity as we read this verse. And I also want to say that I'm not afraid to read this verse. And I'm not afraid for two reasons. One, this is how you are being taught at your school. And so, if they get to brainwash you all week there, I'm going to do as much as I can to wash your brain during the one hour that I have you here. And two, this is scripture. And so the only reason why what I'm about to read might seem funny or silly or even like, whoa, that's in the Bible? And Shane just read that in front of a room full of high schoolers? Is because we bring that thought to the scripture, not because it's actually there. Deuteronomy 23, look at what it says in verse 1. No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Okay, the truth is, believe it or not, this was an ancient practice undergoing some kind of surgery to alter your gender is not a new practice. In this time, pagans, people who did not know God and worship false gods, did this to worship their false gods. They would offer themselves as temple prostitutes. And they weren't called transgender during the time of the Bible. No, they were called by another name. You might be familiar with this, but never understood what it actually means. They were called eunuchs. They made themselves eunuchs. And God says, if you do that to worship a false god, if you alter, change, transition, do something to your gender... You cannot come into my assembly to be with my people or to worship me. God's thoughts are very clear on this. Now go with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 56. Because we should ask the question, well, what if someone made themselves a eunuch and then later in their life they regretted it? What if someone who changed, altered, or transitioned their gender wanted to change back? Was there hope? Look at Isaiah 56. And I'm showing you a verse in the Old Testament because this is the part that people will tell me they think God is mean in. In the Old Testament, God was, he was intense. He was harsh. He was judgmental. No, I want you to see very clearly here tonight that God's heart has always been the same. His thoughts have not changed and his intentions have not changed. For all of eternity, do you want to know what our God has wanted to do? Save sinners. That's what he's all about. 
That's what he wants. That's what he desires. And the truth is, it does not matter what your or anybody else's sin is. God wants and delights and desires to save. That's who our God is. Look at Isaiah 56. Look at verse 3. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name Better than sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. I mean, you want to talk about hope? There is hope for the foreigner. There is hope for the eunuch. There is hope for those who distort God's good design for their gender. The eunuch here says in verse 3, Behold, I am a dry tree. The idea of that is like, well, there's no hope for me to have life. Right, my, my hope for life has been cut off. It's been dried up. Why would they think that? Well, maybe they've gotten to a place in their life after they've done this and they regret their decision, but maybe they've read Deuteronomy 23 verse 1 and they think because of what I've done, I can't come in to the assembly of the Lord. I can't be with God's people. I can't worship God. Maybe that's their thoughts. Maybe they thought they did something that made them unforgivable. That made them cut off from God. And so here is God. God speaking here in Isaiah 56. And what is he saying to them? He's saying to them, I will give you a name that is better than the sons and daughters of Israel. And I will give you a monument in my house is what God says. This is amazing. This is God speaking to this issue. And what is God saying about this issue? There's hope. There's forgiveness. Yes, it's sin, and my thoughts on this are very clear. If you do it and you continue in it, there's no hope. But if you regret it and you come to me by faith and you repent of your ways, there is salvation and forgiveness and life to be found. God speaks here as if someone who did this and then turned from it, it's almost like he would treat them better than someone who's just grown up among God's people and chosen to live for him. That's God's thoughts on this. And we have a tremendous story of this in Scripture. Go with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. You might have been familiar with this story because of how awesome it is, but maybe you've never fully understood the weight of it without this context. God has and does and will continue to save eunuchs, trans people who alter or change their gender in some kind of a way. And we see a story of that actually happening right here in Acts 8. Acts 8, you get Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Maybe you're familiar with this story, but maybe you've never thought about, wow, wait, that's actually what this means? That's what he had done? That's who this guy was? Acts 8, verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that was to go down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now this is a desert place. And so Philip, he rose and he went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. And so Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked him, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I? unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he opens not his mouth and his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth? About whom I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. 
And as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. What a story. You want to know who our God is? Our God is Savior. And what do we see? God saved this Ethiopian eunuch. God saves people who transition, alter, or do something to change their gender. This is how we need to think. This is thinking biblically. And so now we got to ask ourselves, okay, so if that's how I'm supposed to think, well, then how do I engage with all of those people who are swept up in this current storm? We'll go back with me to Genesis 1. Maybe you're talking to someone who is thinking about or has transitioned. Maybe you're just in a conversation with someone about gender and these ideas get brought up. Let's think, how do we engage lovingly? Well, we need to keep a very simple truth in our minds. We need to remember something very important, and it's right here in our verse. Genesis 1, look at verse 27 again. Because just like the word created is repeated three times, there's a thought Or another word that gets repeated two times, and it says this, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You need to understand something very important, that the Bible teaches that men and women, you and me, are created in the image of God. This is called the imago Dei, is how theologians will talk about it. Do you know what it means that we are made in the image of God? See, that doesn't mean that we look like God. It doesn't mean that we have the same appearance as God. What it means to be made in the image of God is that we are like God in the sense that he created us as eternal beings. We are the only work of God's creation that when our bodies die, our souls will go on to live forever in one of two places. See, the the Bible's teaching is very clear that we have bodies, but we are not bodies. Write this down for point number two. People are souls, not bodies. People are souls, not bodies. That's what it means to be created in the image of God. We are the only work of God's creation. No animal, no plant, no creation has a soul other than people. And so we are primarily not our physical appearance, no, we are souls. Now as Christians, when LGBTQ plus issues get brought up in conversation, we can often respond in two ways. I don't know if you found yourself there yet. If you haven't, you most definitely will. If you seek to be a faithful Christian engaging our culture as salt and light, One way that we can respond is we feel flustered. And so we say nothing sometimes, and we shrink back from an opportunity that God is giving us. Or because we feel flustered, we stumble our way through a conversation because we feel afraid to say something that might offend someone. And so what we end up saying doesn't even come across clear. So you don't end up actually saying anything. The other way that we respond is sometimes Christians can be reactive. We get so fired up about this issue that when it gets brought up, we are ready to say something. We have a point. We need to prove our point. You need to agree with my point. Almost to the point where we can come across angry, intense. We can get into arguments, debates. A verse that I want you all to write down on your handout is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, which commands Christians to speak the truth in love. As a Christian, you are commanded to speak the truth. If an opportunity arises for you to speak about an issue, we are commanded to speak what is true, what is right, but yet at the same time, we are commanded to speak in love. And so Christians... We don't argue. We don't debate. We don't raise our voice. We don't minimize a person's feelings, even if they are sinful. No, but as Christians, we do not and we cannot affirm sin. Christians tenderly 
but yet clearly call sin what it is. Sin. We share the good news. We preach the gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection to all people, no matter what their sin or their lifestyle is. And we call sinners. I don't know if you've ever done this. If you have not done this, you need to do this in a loving way. We call sinners to turn from their sin in repentance, to change their mind, to change the way that they're living, and to place all of their faith for their salvation in Christ Jesus. See, this is why you need clear and biblical thoughts. You need to be convinced in your mind. You know what God's word has to say. So that way, when this issue gets brought up, you don't get flustered and you don't get reactive. You can respond in a very clear but yet calm way. Gracious, loving. I want you to understand here tonight, the goal is never to win an argument. The goal is always to win a soul. And because of that, there are two truths that we need to believe. You could write this down in your handout for the first one underneath point number two. Clarity on gender doesn't save. The gospel does. Clarity on gender doesn't save. The gospel does. You need to keep in your mind a simple truth. We know what we believe about gender. We hold to these truths. We are passionate about these truths because of our creator. We're not afraid to engage with someone in a loving conversation about these truths, but it's the gospel message that saves, not convincing someone to change what they think about gender that saves. That does not save. So if you really care about someone, if you truly actually care about someone, you know what you'll do? You will care about their soul more than their body. And if you care about people's souls, you will desperately want to see them saved. And if you desperately want to see people get saved, you know what you'll do? No matter how awkward, no matter how weird you are, and no matter how uncomfortable it gets, you will preach the gospel to them. You will lovingly, but yet clearly, Share the good news that Jesus died for sin, including theirs. And he rose from the grave three days later, and they need to repent and turn from their sin and place all of their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Romans 1.16. Do you know this verse? If you don't know this verse, you need to know this verse. It's the 116 verse where Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ is so powerful. It does not matter who someone is. It does not matter what someone has done. If they believe in that gospel, it is the power to save them and change them. Everything about them will be completely and totally different. And so let me ask you here tonight, as a Christian, a very important question that you need to wrestle with the Lord in prayer about. Are you ashamed of the gospel? To be ashamed means that you shrink back. That when you have an opportunity to share the gospel with someone, you don't speak it clearly. You don't speak it lovingly. You don't speak it boldly. You don't speak it as you ought. No, we're not ashamed of the gospel. You should not be ashamed of the gospel. Do you know why? Because it is the only power of God for salvation. And if you love people and you care about them, you will want to see them get saved. So I'm not going to die on the hill of gender with someone, but I am going to die on the hill that Jesus already died on for them. Write this down as a second truth that we need to believe underneath point number two. Every soul, no matter what their sin, needs to be welcomed at church. Every soul, no matter what their sin, needs to be welcomed at church. You need to understand, the church, including our church, including you as the church, still exist in this world. And one of the primary reasons why we exist in this world is to reach sinners with the good news of the gospel. The church is supposed to make disciples. It's supposed to help those who are lost and dead in their sin know Jesus so they can be saved. Let me just give you a preview of what we're going to study next weekend. 
Okay, if you come here next weekend after this one, if you come back, here's what we're going to study. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, it says, we'll throw it up here on the screen. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, and that's what our sermon's going to be all about next weekend, sexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality, all the things that are going on right now in our day, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then verse 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Paul is writing to a church and he says that in this church, we're filled with people who have been saved. And what were they saved out of? They were saved out of all the sins on that list. The church at Corinth was filled with people who had been saved from sinful lifestyles like homosexuality, sexual immorality, and so much more. See, it does not matter what a person's sin is. We as the church need to welcome them and pursue them with love. And so let me ask you here tonight, do you show partiality? When you show up at church, do you treat some people better than others? Do you walk up to and talk with the people that you already feel comfortable to, with? The people that you already know? Do you just stay with your small group? We shouldn't be scared or awkward when a sinner shows up here at church. We should pray for that. Do you pray that God would draw sinners to come to church? People who are known for their sin? We shouldn't be awkward about that. We shouldn't be weird about that. We shouldn't freak out about that. We shouldn't be surprised when that happens. We should go find those people and we should lovingly invite them to come here. That's what we should do. And when they come, do you know what we should do? We should love them. Every single one of us. Not just me, who has some experience dealing with this issue. Not just some people here in this room who are super friendly and outgoing, like the people who will maybe do announcements sometimes, or the people who serve on the worship team. Every single one of us, if you are the church of Jesus Christ, God has you here, and one of the reasons why he has you here is to make disciples, to welcome, love, care for, and bring people in. Go with me to one last passage here tonight. Let's all turn to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. We're familiar with the story of Saul, who we know as the Apostle Paul, getting saved. Well, Saul, man, I, if you don't know his BC days, the way that he used to live, he was responsible for finding Christians and throwing them in jail. The first person to die in church history because of their faith in Christ Jesus, Saul was the man responsible for stirring up the mob that killed that guy. Saul was a murderer. He was an enemy of Christianity. And Jesus saves him here in Acts chapter 9 as he's on the road to Damascus to go and find Christians and throw them in jail. A lot of us were familiar with that story. Maybe you don't know what happens next. Do you know what happens after Saul gets saved? before he officially becomes maybe what we know him as, the Apostle Paul. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 26. It says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. So here comes Saul the murderer, Saul the persecutor, just threw your friend in jail because of their faith in Christ. He's showing up at church. He wants to sit next to you during the service. And look at what happens. It says, and they were all afraid of him. They're afraid of this guy. For they did not believe that he was a disciple. But, verse 27, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so now because of what Barnabas had done, Saul went in and out among them. Man, he's a part of the church. He's been welcomed in. And what is he doing? He's preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke. He disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So, verse 31, the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. 
Don't you love that? I love that verse right there. What is God doing in verse 31? Faithfully building his church as he's always done. The church is growing because people are getting saved. The church is being sanctified as the word is ringing out. And now who is the main man responsible for causing some of these things to happen? Saul. He's going in and out. He's preaching. He's evangelizing. He's a faithful leader in the church. Would that have happened if Barnabas did not go and find him and bring him in and welcome him and declare to all the other apostles what God had done in this man's life after he tried to join and everybody's scared and so nobody welcomes him in? What would have happened? Could you imagine how tough that would be? Maybe some of you guys have experienced that. You walk into church for the first time, you're the new kid, you're so nervous, especially if you're salt. You know your past, and everybody else knows your past. You know what you've done. Everybody else knows what you've done. Could you imagine how uncomfortable you would feel, and then you walk in, and everybody's afraid of you, and nobody wants to talk to you, and everybody's standing across the room kind of not wanting to make eye contact, but like, is that really him? Is that Saul? Saul of Tarsus? Didn't he just throw Jeff in jail? Is that him? And we're all... Too scared to go up and talk to him. Man, we need to be Barnabas. We need to find sinners. We need to welcome them. We need to bring them in. Let me ask you here tonight, when was the last time that you, I'm asking you here tonight, when was the last time that you went up to someone at church that you didn't know you introduced yourself, you talked with them, you set up a time to hang outside, outside of church with them, and you tried to become their friend. I, I, I praise God that United is a friendly place, but let's make it very clear, friendly places don't win souls, friends win souls. So whose friend are you becoming? I pray, I want you to know, I pray for the day When United is filled with high schoolers who came from all kinds of different backgrounds. I pray for the day when my small group has church kids who have grown up going to church their whole life and are homeschooled sitting right next to someone who has detransitioned from their transitioned gender. I want that to happen. And just watch them become best friends. This guy can't hold a conversation with anybody. He's so awkward. And this guy over here, he used to be a guy, and then he identified as a girl, and now he's back to being a guy. <sighs> Do you want to see that happen? I want to see that happen. And if you want to see that happen, you know what? We need to be ready to do it. God is the creator. The creator defines gender. We are the creation. We don't have the right to redefine gender no matter how we feel. And so as Christians, we understand that people have sinful feelings. We don't minimize them or dismiss them. But what we do is we lovingly share the gospel with them. We welcome them at church and we call them to repent of their sin and find forgiveness in Christ Jesus. And we pray for God to save. So this is how we think and this is how we engage. Our world that we live in, is just going from bad to worse. I told you last week, and I don't know if you did it, if you haven't done it yet, do it this week. Read Revelation 18. Babylon is going to fall. So let's pray for revival, but at the same time, let's not be naive. This world is not our home. So don't try to be comfortable. Stand out. Understand that people will not like you. Not everybody's going to accept you. But that's what it means to faithfully represent Christ. On January 7, 2022, just a year ago, a new bill went into effect in Canada. And this uh, bill, this law was passed unanimously. The process of the bill becoming a law was expedited, which means that it was sped up so it would happen faster. And the bill banned what has been called conversion therapy. And here's how the bill defines conversion therapy. Conversion therapy means a practice, treatment, or service designed to change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual 
or to change a person's gender identity to cisgender, or to change a person's gender expression so that it conforms to the sex assigned to the person at birth, to repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior, to repress a person's non-cisgender gender identity, or to repress or reduce a person's gender expression that does not conform to the sex assigned to the person at birth. So basically, if you didn't follow that at all, if you help someone detransition, according to this bill in Canada, you could be thrown in jail for five years. Now, that might shock you, that might scare you, that might even upset you, but I hope you can see from our study here today, this is not new. It goes all the way back to Deuteronomy 23. There is nothing new under the sun. And so don't be swayed when people say, oh man, our world has never been this bad. But at the same time, don't be fooled. Things will go from bad to worse. And that should not scare us. That should not change us. Do you know what that should do? That should embolden us. Do you know why? Because you were made for such a time as this. God does not make mistakes. God is sovereign. And he placed you where you are, when you are, and who you are as a Christian, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And where does light shine the brightest and the darkest of places? So yes, our world is growing darker and darker and darker, but you are the light of the world. You don't be the light of the world. You are the light of the world, according to Christ Jesus. And so go live your life faithfully to represent Christ to share the gospel in a very dark world and you will shine the light and watch what God does as he faithfully builds his church as he has promised. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid. Don't get upset. Be emboldened and trust what our good, faithful, gracious, loving, forgiving God will do as a group of us go live exactly how he wants us to live.